Hey everybody, it's Gomladax, and welcome to the Lost Caverns of Ixalan Early Access event. In today's video, I'll be playing my very first premiere draft of the brand new format, so thanks to Wizards of the Coast for the promotional Early Access account, but without further ado, let's just hop into the draft. Alright, here we are for our pack one pick one, and we have one of the gods. It is one of the weaker gods in my opinion. This is a 6 mana 6-6 six, six Vigilance. If one or more creature tokens would be placed under your control, you get three times that many instead, and when it dies, it transforms into the Temple of Civilization, which can then flip back into O'Hare Talk if you attack with three creatures in one turn. So one of the weaker gods, because the tripling up your creature tokens ability doesn't matter too much by the time you're at turn six, you probably don't have much creature token production left, because most of that in the set just produces like a 1-1 one -one gnome for three mana or something like that. So, I don't love its ability there. A 6 mana 6-6 six, six Vigilance up front is only okay, and this is one of the harder ones to flip back, because you have to still have the ability to be attacking with three or more creatures that late in the game, but I'm still going to take this and try it out and play it over anything else here, but if we were later in the format, the best pick here might be like a Scampering Surveyor, just a really solid value play, kind of like a Solemn Simulacrum that hits the board and searches for any basic land or cave, puts it into the board or onto the board, tapped, um, and it's a colorless spell, so it fits into, like, any deck, so I think that, uh, that gnome's pretty great, pretty flexible, but can't really resist trying to start things off with the god here. For pick two, here's something that's going to be even harder for me to resist, the Throne of the Grim Captain. This shows off some of the graveyard mechanics in this set, and there's a lot of those here. This one shows off the craft mechanics, so with craft, you can spend your craft mana cost and then exile all the cards that are acquired from your battlefield or your graveyard to flip this card. So with this, if we spend four mana and exile a dinosaur, merfolk, pirate, and vampire from our battlefield or graveyard, we flip this into an absolutely insane 7-7 menace, trample, lifelink, and most importantly, hexproof that makes our opponent sack a non-land permanent when it attacks and gets to spit out those cards that we exiled onto the battlefield alongside it when it attacks. So I'm taking the Throne of the Grim Captain. Yeah, it does seem like it will be pretty hard to get a Dinosaur, Merfolk, Vampire, and uh, what is the last one? Pirate. But because those overlap in multiple colors, you can play like a three-color deck and hit all of those creature types, and this fuels its own craft ability by milling you two cards every turn to try to dig there. So we're going deep right off the bat in this format. For pack one, pick three, we do see a pirate with the Oaken Siren. We see a dinosaur with the Pathfinding Axe Draw. So those are both important card types. Also a vampire with the Echo of Dusk. I think the strongest of these cards is likely the Pathfinding Axtra. I do think Explore is just a great value ability, letting you pick up a land from the top of your deck if there's one there, and otherwise letting you put the card back or put it into your graveyard. So that's another way to fill your graveyard for the graveyard mechanics, like Craft that we just talked about, but also Descend, which is a mechanic that just makes it so you want to have a lot of permanence in your graveyard. So I'm going to take the Pathfinding Axtra here. For pick four now, we have another dinosaur with a dinotomaton. We have no other important creature types for the throne of the Grim Captain. So now we might want to just see if there's any powerful white spells to go along with O'Hare Talk. We have Clay Fired Bricks, another craft card. So two mana to search your library for a planes, reveal it, put into your hand and gain two. Then for seven mana later in the game, you can exile an artifact on board or in your graveyard to transform this into the kiln, which gives you two one ones and gives all your creatures plus one plus one. Pretty slow, but a decent amount of value there. Not super excited about that, but honestly not super excited about the looks of basically anything in the pack. I do like Skull Snap, Skull Cap Snail as just a value play in general in black, but I don't know. I guess I'll still take the Clay Fired Bricks there. Not an excellent pack. For pick five, there is one pirate in here for the creature types that we're looking for, but it's a pretty weak one that we're not very excited about. There is an excellent removal spell with a braid. This is definitely a premium common in the format, dealing three to target creature at instant speed, or destroying an artifact, and there are a lot of artifacts in the set. 
as you can see, there's an artifact creature in this exact pack. So big fan of the abrade here. I think I'm going to take that. And I'm just going to keep trying to do this throw into the Grim Captain thing if we can get there. All right, pick six. We have a much better pirate in this pack and a really good merfolk. Spyglass Siren is a one mana, one one flying pirate. It enters the battlefield with a map token that you can use to explore. Or we can take the Rivered Herald Scout, which is just straight up going to explore when we play it. I think the Siren's better, just the, basically a 2-mana 1-1 one, one flyer that explores versus a 2-mana 1-2 one, that explores. I think I like the flyer better. Now we have a pirate and a dinosaur here. Here's another pirate, a second Spyglass Siren. Could be pretty reasonable to try to go for blue-green at the core of this deck because the blue-green mechanics in this format are those that care a lot about uh, exploring multiple times. And now we have three ways to do so with two Spyglass Sirens and one Pathfinding Axe draw already. And that's going to hit some good creature types. We can get pirates, dinosaurs, and merfolk. We just need to splash in a vampire or two to get the throne working. So let's take the Spyglass Siren. Pick eight, we do see a vampire to splash in. Alternatively, a solid removal spell with the Dusk Rose Reliquary, where we can sacrifice like a map token uh, or a treasure token to exile something, as long as the Dusk Rose Reliquary sticks around. I think I would rather scoop up a vampire here with the Glorifier of Suffering. For pick 9, we now have an Orc Pirate with the Plundering Pirate, and it will also be helpful for splashing around here. Because it gives us a treasure token. I think that's pretty reasonable. So we could be blue-red using treasures to splash in the other colors. Or we could be blue-green using a bunch of explore to dig for lands to splash in the other colors. And explore can like naturally mill our, uh, our off-color cards as well, which is nice. Take another plundering pirate here for the treasure and the creature type. Now we have another uh, on-type card, the Oaken Siren. I don't think this looks very good in here though, because it just taps for mana for artifact stuff. And we're only playing one artifact, the Throne of the Grim Captain, likely. Maybe it's better to just take a hidden nursery in case green is a main color. Probably is. I've already got four pirates in here if we're blue-red, which is pretty good on those counts. Now we have a Child of the Volcano that gets a plus one plus one counter every turn in which a permanent was put into our graveyard. That's cute. The gnome's cute. All this stuff is mainly just cute. It's none of the good creature types for our throne, which is what I'm really drafting after today. Unlucky drop is interaction. It is kind of removal, so we'll run it for now. All right. Well, we're doing things. We're doing some combination of things here. Do we have any great creatures that are on type? We do not in this pack we can take the very solid removal of the rumbling rock slide we can take an okay card on creature type the dinatomaton is a dinosaur or we could take this a call call first among equals which looks like a great great rare for this deck we are mostly blue and red right now and with the spyglass sirens we get map tokens that's an artifact entering the battlefield under our control and with the Plundering Pirates, we get treasure tokens that are artifacts entering the battlefield under our control. So with any of those happening, we're triggering a call to call and drawing extra cards and filling our graveyard at the same time. So this rare actually seems really sweet with map tokens, treasure tokens, and we've certainly got that going on. So let's take the call to call here. Now we have a red dinosaur with the panicked altasaur. So for blue red at the core, this helps get our creature types towards our throne of the grim captain. Could also take a black vampire with vetoes inquisitor. Or another green dinosaur with the nurturing bristleback and this helps splash in green because of the forest cycling. So we can we can cycle this 
to get our green source and put a dinosaur in our graveyard for our craft at the same time. So that's actually kind of spicy for fixing. Yeah, I don't think the blue or red cards are super excellent looking in this pack, so I might speculate on the Nurturing Bristleback as a way to splash in green and just shove a dino in our grave at the same time. Another pirate with our Goblin Tomb Raider. Don't have any Merfolk yet. We really want to pick up some blue Merfolk, ideally, since green is looking like hopefully the splash here. Could try to go five color, run a Restless Vents to get the red and black source in here at the same time. So we get to run this over a mountain and have just a free black source if I randomly draw a black vampire. Maybe that is the thing. Red, blue, splash, a little green and black to fit vampires in. Might be okay. We could also just take another bristle back towards a green splash. But we could get red dinos. Yeah, let's take the Restless Vents here. Let's get splashy and just get crazy with this first draft. Pick four, another Pathfinding Axe Draw. We also have an Inverted Iceberg, which looks nice for this deck. It can trigger a Call Pa Call. It's a great late game value play where we mill a card, draw a card, then later exile an artifact from our graveyard or battlefield to flip this into a 6-6. Six, six. So kind of like if you've played some Wilds of Eldrain, kind of like a creature that has a 2-man adventure to draw a card, and then it's just a 6-mana six 6-6, six, six, which is pretty great. I think Iceberg's pretty interesting to me. Also, Join the Dead, but that is a hard removal spell to splash, costing double black. It's a great removal spell, though. But I think we're going for the Inverted Iceberg here. Pack two, pick number five. Could start taking a bunch of caves with a Calamitous cave in. Use this as a board wipe for a grindier kind of deck. It's pretty cute. I think the blue-red core of our deck already looks pretty good, though. If we want to just do, like, a tiny bit of splashing, like the bristleback bristle kind of thing. And the cave-in doesn't really help splash, it just gives us a board wipe if our deck ends up being really slow. Promising Vein helps us splash. You know, I don't think the Promising Vein is a particularly good way to help splash mana, but we need some ways to do so for this pile of cards, most likely. For pick six, we have a Vito's Inquisitor for a Vampire. We have a Cavern Stomper for a Dinosaur. We have a Hidden Necropolis for a cave, but I don't think we have any actual cards that care about caves right now. There's an on-color dinosaur, a red dinosaur here for our blue-red deck. Yeah, I'm going to go for the red dinosaur here. Ooh, Captain Storm this late is an excellent sign for us. A little sad to have to take it over Rumbling Rock Slide, which is a great removal spell. But the Captain Storm is a very, very fantastic card when you're spinning out map tokens and treasure tokens. And again, we already have four cards that do that. Two Spyglass Sirens and two Plundering Pirates. And this, of course, puts another pirate in our deck, which is premium. Pick eight, we can grab another Inverted Iceberg, which works great with our artifact cards like the Captain Storm and the Akal Bakal, while being a good late game play. Filling our graveyard for our craft stuff. We do get a Rumbling Rock Slide now, pick 9, which is going to be pretty important. I think Ancestral Reminiscence and Charter Course would also be good ways to dig through our deck and hopefully discard one of our off-color vampires or something towards the throne of the Grim Captain. But we need the consistency of just solid removal to stop our opponent from doing something super scary. And let's say I'm blue-red, and we just use the on-color red dinosaurs here. Uh, we have zero vampires. We have some white ones, but with the restless vents, we probably would prefer some black ones, like Vito's Inquisitor, to try to get there. Another Vito's Inquisitor. Probably a lot safer to take waylaying pirates and just be straight blue-red here, but I'm going to take Vito's Inquisitor. 
I think it's going to be way too hard to stop me from trying to play this Throne of the Grim Captain at least one time in this format, and if I can get it out of the way immediately, that'll be awesome. Here's another on-color dinosaur, which is super helpful. Uh, I only have one cave in the deck. I don't think I'd take a Calamitous Cave in here. Cogwork Wrestler is actually probably not horrible since we have the Captain Storm and the Akalba Call. So I'll throw a Wrestler in here because it's cute. Here's another token producer, which could be good. And a Human Wizard. Probably not great, but fits in at three mana. Pack three, pick number one. We get our first Merfolk that also triggers our Artifact Enter the Battlefield effects. This is kind of like the perfect synergy piece for our deck. I think we got to take Waterwind Scout here. But Staunch Crewmate is great for just the blue-red Pirate and Artifact deck at the core. But again, I'm going for dirtily silly Throne of the Grim Captain stuff alongside it, where Waterwind Scout definitely gets the edge here. Now we have another Plundering Pirate. Helps a lot for the splashes and the artifact enter the battlefield effects. I think that is just a premium pickup for this deck. Yeah, we'll scoop it up here over a veto. That's going to be pretty hard splash, white and black. Pack three, pick number three. Another rumbling rock slide looks pretty great. We have a Captivating Cave for another dirtily Mana Fixer. We also have Poetic Ingenuity. How many Artifact Spells do I have that would make Dinos when we cast them? Five? Five Artifact Spells is probably a little bit low for Poetic Ingenuity. Yeah, I don't love that here. Sahili's Lattice would be a decent synergy piece for this deck, too. Discard a card, draw two, discard an off-color card or something, but I'm just going to take the Rumbling Rock Slide. Make sure I actually have a little more interaction again. Here's another Rumbling Rock Slide, which I could certainly take. Or an Inverted Iceberg. Or a Staunch Crewmate. What is the Artifact and Pirate count in the deck, if we add both together? Six pirates, five artifacts, that's 11 cards, and we're digging four cards deep off that card draw. I think Staunch Crewmate looks good enough to scoop up over another rock slide, especially since I did get our second copy now, at least. Now, pack three, pick five. It's a good off-color creature type. We can get another merfolk in this deck. I think I only have one merfolk right now, which is... Bad. Yeah, we only have one Merfolk. Getting a green one in would be pretty hard, though. And Geological Appraiser is just such a great card up front. A 4-mana 3-2 that discovers 3, so it flips cards from the top until you hit a spell with mana value 3 or less, and it casts it for free. So basically a 4-mana 3-2 that draws you a card, but it casts the card immediately. Card's pretty bonkers. I think we have to just take that. Pack 3, pick 6. Dang, I think... All the blue merfolk are really getting scooped up, which is so rough for our Throne of the Grim Captain, because we were really relying on trying to get there. Everflowing Well looks pretty reasonable for this deck, though. It's an artifact entering the battlefield. It's a piece of card draw and a piece of self-mill for craft stuff. For the, uh, the icebergs at the least, even if the Throne of the Grim Captain doesn't quite get there. Okay. We definitely don't have enough Explore to play a card that doesn't do anything unless we're... Or sorry, not Explore. We definitely don't have enough Discover to play a card that doesn't do anything unless we're Discovering. Um, so it's probably the Hidden Volcano here. If I Flood out, I can sack this and cast something else for free. Another Plundering Pirate? Sure. So I've got two vampires, but only one merfolk. I don't think I actually got there with Throne of the Grim Captain in the end, which is super sad because it looks like nobody's drafting like merfolk specifically either. They're not taking Deep Root Pilgrimage here. Just didn't manage to, to find them. Oh my god, we wield the staunch crewmate? Okay. Well, tried to do the, the all creature type mush thing, and we kind of just ended up blue-red artifact pirates in the end. 
sadly. But the deck looks good. The deck looks real, real solid, even if we're not doing the super spicy, super fun kind of stuff there. Wow, we got the Sahili's Lattice to come back too. This looks really good for a dinosaur deck as a card draw spell, because if you're a dedicated red-green dinosaur deck, you just play this, discard one of your expensive dinosaurs to draw to, since you don't have the mana to play it yet anyway, uh, and then you just flip it and exile that dinosaur from your graveyard to get a really big dino out of this, so a really good card draw for red-green dinos. Take another rock slide here, but I do like the iceberg a lot. Another pirate. And, uh, yeah. Let's get some blue-red pirate nonsense going. Okay. I don't hate it. We're not doing anything super spicy, super crazy, super dumb like Throne of the Grim Captain anymore, but we've got, like, the cookie-cutter ideal blue-red pirates deck here. So we get to cut nine cards out of this deck. So find our nine least efficient, dirtiest cards, which Unlucky Drop definitely fits in there when we have Rumbling Rock Slides in its place. I like the Abrade a lot better too. Eaten by Piranhas doesn't seem great. I mean, it's good against the Mythic Rare Gods that can keep coming back and stuff. Shutting off all their abilities seems pretty good, but... Seems more like a sideboard card in general. Uh, Tolly's Favor is just okay. I think with double Iceberg in the deck, hopefully I do have enough uh, graveyard shenanigans to still want to play the Everflowing well. We're never going to descend with this, but just treating this as a three mana sorcery that draws two and mills two can still be pretty good in some decks in the format. I don't know, maybe we have enough uh, treasure production and... Mm, just other artifacts and map production that we don't need the well for an artifact hitting the board. I don't think that's as bad as these other two cards, though, so I'm just putting that in the maybe pile closer to keeping it. Same place I'm putting Eaten by Piranhas, like maybe, but closer to a keep. I think we definitely take the Brackish Blunder in this deck. Ideally, we use this on a tapped creature and get a map token at instant speed, trigger a Captain Storm, or trigger an Akalpa Call. be pretty great. Yeah, some good synergies there. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven non-creature spells. I think that's a reasonable non-creature count. Maybe cut one more of these in the end. Uh, but now we should focus on dropping some creatures. So this would be 45 cards if I cut all four of these. So we want to cut at least five creatures. Now that we are just, uh, just blue-red pirates, sadly, I think we're dropping the probably Altasar, Sahili's Lattice, Dinatomaton dino package and just zeroing in on dinosaurs or sorry zeroing in on pirates here as the uh the main creature type not that we have anything that specifically cares about pirates um but we have a low enough dino count that i don't think we should be playing the Sahili's lattice that specifically cares about dinos which is the biggest reason to play the other two dinos here i mean we could still play dino automaton actually it's an artifact hitting the board. It's a solid-sized menacer. I just don't think the Altasar is going to be that exciting. I think we're quick enough to not really want the 4-5 body. I don't know. Maybe. I'll put that in the maybe, but I think Lattice is like a, a definite cut. When we don't have a lot of dinosaurs to discard to it. Alright, Sage of Days is not doing anything super great for the deck it does set up your next draw but it doesn't put you up a card in any way because it's not actually drawing anything it's just rearranging your top milling yourself a little bit milling yourself is nice putting things into the graveyard for your craft cards and for your descend cards but i think we're already decent enough at doing that for the amount of craft and descend that we have which is literally just like two cards we don't have any descend in this deck that wants four permanents in our grave or anything like that we just have the craft stuff, and I think we're doing great on having enough artifacts for the icebergs to flip into the uh, the six mana six sixes. So I don't think Sage of Days is necessary. I think we drop Lattice, Unlucky Favor, or Unlucky Drop, and Atali's Favor. Uh, and if we treat these as six mana creatures, that does really drop the need for the five four or the four five dinosaur as well. So I'll cut that here. I really like the rest of our three mana cards, mainly the ones that all 
put an artifact token on the board immediately because they're all just so good with the Captain Storm and the Akal Pakal. Sunshot Militia does kind of look okay in here because we will have treasure tokens and map tokens sitting around to tap. I mean, pinging our opponent for like one damage to their face at sorcery speed isn't nuts or anything, but I think it's a fine filler two mana creature for the deck. I don't hate it. I think Blade Master is the weakest of our three mana cards, and we have a lot of them, so I'll drop that. I'm kind of interested in dropping Confounding Riddle as well. We do not have a lot of instant speed stuff, so I'm not going to be holding this up as a counterspell too much. I guess the really nice thing about Confounding Riddle is that the big flaw in counterspells is when you hold up your counterspell and your opponent doesn't cast something, they just use abilities and stuff like that then you just haven't spent your mana on anything. This does single-handedly get around that. Like, if you don't counter something with it, you can still cast it to draw a card during their end step. But I don't think that's the most exciting thing ever anyway, just to be drawing a card. So, yeah, I think these three can be the cuts, and that drops us down to our 40-card deck here. 17 lands is still reasonable when one of our lands discovers, and we have some 6-drops in the deck. Even if we have treasure production, I think 17 lands is fine. Yeah, I think this looks cool. And Wrestler does look fun in here as an instant speed little artifact to trigger Captain Storm when we're lucky. And otherwise, it's just a little, little combat trick dork, which is cute. I mean, look at the artwork. We have to run one copy of Cogwork Wrestler. Come on. This is gonna be the final deck. All right, and here's a look at the final deck list for today. And we're on a blue-red Pirates deck. Now the blue-red archetype in this format is a little bit less focused on pirates as a creature type, so much as it is artifacts in general. A lot of creatures like Captain Storm that will get you triggers when artifacts are entering the battlefield under your control. So there's a little bit of crisscross between the pirate creature type synergies and the artifacts entering the battlefield synergies. So with Captain Storm, whenever we're creating map tokens with cards like Spyglass Siren, whenever we're creating treasure tokens with cards like Plundering Pirate, and whenever we're just straight up playing artifacts like Inverted Icebergs, we're getting a plus one plus one counter onto any pirate that we control, which includes Captain Storm. So technically, you don't even need to be a strictly pirates deck to make Captain Storm a pretty good card, because you can just put the counters on Captain Storm herself. That being said, a lot of the greatest ways to trigger Captain Storm do happen to be pirate creatures, like the Plundering Pirates, the Spyglass Sirens, and stuff as well, so we've got a lot of that going on. And with the pirate sub-theme, we have cards like Staunch Crewmate that are a 2-mana two 2-1 two that draws us an additional pirate or artifact out of the top four cards of our library when they hit the board, so a great value play on curve there. And we have another sweet artifact value rare in our deck, the Akal Pakal, first among equals, a three mana 1-5 who's going to let us look at the top two cards of our library, put one into our hands and one into our graveyard at the end step of every turn in which we played an artifact. So this again works with all of our artifact tokens and our artifact spells. So really great value engine there. A lot of sweet stuff going on with the artifact and pirate synergies. Of course, your deck can't rely solely on solid synergies like that. You want to have your bread and butter spells that fit into every deck, like removal spells with three rumbling rock slide and an abrade, a little bit of card drawn interaction with brackish blunder, and Araska Puzzle Door as well. So that is today's deck list. Looks like a very fun one. I'm super excited to see how it does as we head into the gameplay. Here we are now for game one with a pretty awkward opening hand. We have to draw into a land to get this hand to work, but if we do, we can play a Plundering Pirate and use the treasure token to play Geological Appraiser the next turn, even if we don't hit our fourth mana. And that'll give us a very wide board state, which is nice. And no matter what we draw, we have a piece of interaction to stop our opponent from being super, super steamrolly with their aggressive curve. So I am going to keep it here. It's a bit risky. We have to hit a land in the top three cards of this deck to be happy. But I've got hopes and dreams. I believe that it can happen. And as soon as we hit one mana, we're golden. We can just play multiple pirates in a row to have some treasure tokens sitting around to play any four drops that we want to play throughout the game here. We did draw into a staunch crewmate, which gives us an excellent turn two play. 
Our opponent is on green-white using a Glimpse the Core on turn two to go ahead and find another forest and put it into play tapped. So they are ramping up. Let's see what our crewmate finds us here. Finds a Spyglass Siren. Great spell for us. This is going to dig us towards the land no matter what, because when we sack that map token to explore, even if it's not a land on top of our deck, we can just mill that card and dig closer to one. And that is going to be the case, and we're going to need to find that mana soon, because our opponent has now dropped Colossodactyl, a 4-5 Reach Trample, which we cannot attack through. We can't kill it without 2 for one ourselves, trading our crewmate and a Braid into it. So we really just need to find mana, I think, to try to out, uh, outpace this kind of card. I mean, I could still just abrade it here. Feels... I guess with how many cards I have in hand and the inherent card advantage of Appraiser and map tokens, it actually probably is okay to go for the two for one here. Obviously a trade in our opponent's favor, card advantage wise, but it deals with a pretty big threat that's going to be a large issue for us. And there's always the possibility that our opponent just doesn't want to block here because the format's brand new. It would be really hard to know exactly what I could have here. Maybe there is a plus three plus zero oh first strike trick where I'd only have to spend one card to kill their dinosaur. All right, so here's the Spyglass Siren. And I'm going to explore targeting the Siren here, because if they attack with Colossodactyl, they probably won't have other flying blockers. I'm going to mill another Siren, because that is just going to dig me towards a land again. If I just mill it, I've already pre-dug one card further without spending mana to do it. Let's see what they have here, turn 5. Disturbed Slumber. Turn a land into a 4-4 and force us to block. So basically a removal spell for the Spyglass Siren. Not great for us, but not horrific. Since it did cost them a card to kill our creature. Just a 1-for-1 one one removal spell, basically. Now a treasure map. This is an incredible value play. A reprint from the original Ixalan. They get to scry one three times, then they'll flip this and get three treasure tokens that they can sacrifice to draw extra cards. So excellent value play here. They've only got two cards in hand, and we're going to really hope those are not removal spells, because I'm just going to drop a call per call, which is large enough to block Colossodactyl without dying, while setting up a big value engine if they can stick around. There's a Poison Dart Frog. This taps for mana of any color. It's also got Reach to block our flyers, and it can get Death Touch for two mana to trade up later in the game. Nice, flexible little mana dork for the format. Jamming with the Colossodactyl. Our Akal Pakal would die to a combat trick if I go for a block here. I think I'm going to get a little greedy, and I am not going to block here just to make sure a call calls on the board next turn if they're trying to kill them with a combat trick, so I can hopefully have Cogwork Wrestler up when I go for the call call block next turn. And maybe the Wrestler's minus 2 minus 0 is enough to save this from a combat trick, we'll see. It might not be, but this way, even if a call call dies next turn, we get a treasure from our Plundering Pirate. Rumbling Rock Slide's a good draw if we can find two more lands, but we do really need to find two more lands. I suppose now on board I can threaten to double block the Colossodactyl, so if I just hold back here that's probably fine too. Yep, there's a land. Yeah, I think I'm just going full all-in on the card advantage of our rare. And just two for wanting ourselves every chance we get to clear out their board. Because I have so many ways to trigger this and keep drawing cards that as long as this is still around, we're not going to run out of stuff to do. Alright, I think Call has a really important ability here. So I'm not going to put them at any risk. But I think we could double block the Colossodactyl or go for a one-for-one -one trade on the Poison Dart Frog. I guess we can try to do both at the same time. The flaw of this is that 
they'll know exactly what Colossodactyl's power is before they go for a combat trick. But I think that's fine, because this lets us get every single creature blocked, and unless they have two combat tricks, we will kill one thing. And of course, in our end step... Oh, they're going to give their stuff hexproof. Okay. That's pretty fine. Unless they have double combat trick. Again, I think the only way this goes really wrong for us is if they have double combat trick. If they just have the one, then Wrestler trades into the Dart Frog, and we still double block and trade into Colossodactyl. And then, of course, end step of our turn, we played an artifact, so we draw another card off our rare. Alright, let's see that second combat trick here. It is a second combat trick. I think we're still in a reasonable position. We're at 10 life, and we're going to have way, way more cards. Got all red spells in my hand, so I'll grab the red source over the blue source here. Drawn to an inverted iceberg. So one land away from Rock Slide, we have the land in our hand, so I know next turn I can do five to the Colossodactyl. For now, I can Plundering Pirate and Abrade their treasure map right before they flip it. That does seem pretty sick to me. Yeah, we'll do it right now while it's tapped. And this counters their draw three from the treasure map. Because next turn they can respond by tapping it and flipping it when I try to abrade it, so we have to do it before their untap step. Draw another rock slide? Sure. And that puts an artifact in my graveyard for the inverted iceberg. Yep. Exactly one artifact and grave there. To craft this one. Now they have a Miner's Guide Wing. Flying Vigilance, when it dies, they get to explore. And a Kin Caller, which is just a 3-3. I think this is where we're flipping the game in our favor. We have so many spells here. Our opponent's tapped out, so we know we can block here, right? Yeah, they have no cards in hand. We just get the free block. Okay. Now my rock slide is big enough, so I think I just... I guess I don't need to, right? I can just go 3-2 there, 1-5 there. So I don't need to rock slide right now. With two rock slides in hand, probably still just do, though. Yeah, let's just rock slide the Colossodactyl. Start taking one damage a turn. Blocking their 3-3 with my 1-5. Unless they top deck a combat trick, then they can kill a Kalpakal. One damage in the sky, down to nine. There's our sixth mana for the inverted iceberg flip later. I do need to not mill out. That is going to be a thing in this format. I am realizing pretty quickly. A lot of that's because this rare, but still. Send in a 3-2, get ready to flip a 6-6, six, six, I think. We can flip a 6-6 six, six and discover a card this turn, which is gross. I suppose I'll discover a card first and see if that changes what I might want to do here, but I doubt it will. Ooh, well I'm glad I discovered first, because now we get a plus one plus one counter on any pirate we control. Probably just put it on Captain Storm. Since she is untapped. Down to 12 cards. And this is not a May ability. We have to do the mill thing. So we do need to start actually closing things out with the cards we have here. All right, the Petrify doesn't matter. We still get our triggered ability. Although we don't want to play too many more artifacts because of all the mill that we're going to be doing. All right, cool. Play one more artifact. We mill down to nine cards in deck. I think that's still going to close out the game fast enough. 
Yeah, we play the Iceberg Titan, I imagine. I guess I do it post-combat. Because if I do it pre-combat, then... Well, no, I only have one pirate, so it doesn't matter. If I do it pre-combat or post-combat, the pirate just trades into the kin collar. So maybe we do just rock slide here and send the team in. But then I have no removal left if something really spooky happens. Yeah, I think I'd rather keep the rock slide just in case. I'm going to go for the Captain Storm post-combat. Just so maybe they won't just insta-trade with Plundering Pirate here. Alright, they still trade with the Plundering Pirate. So we would have done the same damage regardless because that was our only pirate to put the counter on. Pick up a bounce spell. Mill another artifact. If we had another uh, iceberg on the board, but our other iceberg is in exile, so... That's not going to happen. We are chipped down to seven. And nine, eight cards in library here. Ooh, Sunshot Militia is actually damage. Tap all our one fives and stuff. I just tap something every time it attacks, right? Tap or untap an artifact or creature, so it's already lethal on board. Let's just go for lethal. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Boom. All right, really spicy stuff. From the blue-red pirate stack, a lot of great artifact triggers. That was a call -a calls game there. So much card advantage was grinded out throughout that game, just digging for whatever we needed. Grabbing a few lands, the first few triggers, was super excellent for us. We start things off 1-0, heading into round two. Here we are now, game two against LSV himself, my favorite pro player who's been making content about Limited, about Draft and Sealed for like over a decade now. I don't know if it's decades plural, but it might be. Probably not. Blue Red Pirate Mirror Match it is, and LSV is definitely on the artifact build as well, with a Goblin Tomb Raider starting things off. Ooh, and a Diamond Pickaxe to toss onto that later. Okay, I've already got all the mana I need, so exploring doesn't feel massively powerful. I could explore and get my tap land out of the way, rather than playing Iceberg right now. I don't hate that. Yeah, let's explore. Get the tap land out of the way. Get an untapped land. Poke for one, because we can't block a two too well. There's a careening minecart, which doesn't have haste, luckily. But that does spit out a treasure every time it attacks, which is great. Now we play a water wind scout this turn. Plus one, plus one. I don't imagine I'm going to want to double block a minecart or a tomb raider. But LSV is down to three cards, so it might not be horrific to do so. I don't know, I two for one myself to do that. But it grinds out towards getting to the six drop. Yeah, I think I just send in and drop the scout pass. Alright, so crew the minecart, send in the 3-3, three, three, get a treasure token. It's going to be crew the minecart and equip the minecart with a pickaxe? That would be hilarious flavor-wise. Nah, I'll play a plundering pirate alongside it. Fair enough. Down to 13. The treasure is just flowing over there. So clear out the plundering pirate. It's best we can do with our mana this turn. Jam in, we just don't have very good blocks at all here. If I just hold up two blockers, LSV could like crew a minecart and equip. And even just equipping a Tomb Raider and attacking with their 3-3 three, three, one drop into our three power and toughness is pretty bad for us. Yeah. 
Ooh, three treasure tokens alongside the Sunshot Militia to just get major damage in. Yeah, much more aggressive hand from LSV than us here. And we're just going to get rolled. Yeah, this is a lot of lands, which slows us down even more. I mean, we're pretty much dead no matter what we do here. So I just kill the militia and die. Alright, staunch crewmate is not horrific. Another plundering pirate. Which crews the minecart. LSV gets to attack with two 3-3s, three and one has Menace off Dynatomaton. So LSV chooses which one we get to kill, which is going to be the Tomb Raider. Actually, no, we could double block. So we could still kill whichever one we want. Yeah, I don't know what we're supposed to kill here. I don't think it really matters. Five life? I might just go chump. Well, here, let's just throw that there. Find a crewmate for double block on Dynatomaton. But I need one more blocker to not die. So I need it to hit something. There's a spyglass siren. That is something. So I can double block Dynatomaton and chump the plundering pirate or the minecart, whichever attacks. All right, I think it took me a long time to figure out what to do with the block last turn, but I think I did make the right block because the minecart requires them to tap a creature to get it going. So, four, five, six. I don't know the mana to play pirate and flip iceberg, so I think I need to leave the map. So I can flip the Iceberg with the map next turn. See what LSV draws here. LSV definitely has the mana to discover. So even if he draws dead, cast something off that. It is unlucky drop. Eh, more like lucky drop this game, I would say, because that is lethal. Discover the four drop two off of the discover four ability. That is great stuff for LSV. All right. Got rolled, but I don't think I was astronomically far away from stabilizing here. Because a six six would have been a large deal, obviously. But yeah, LSV's curve was much more aggressive that was impressive all those treasure tokens minecart plus the pickaxe to just dump the hand super quick is hard to stabilize against and we will be one and one heading into game three here we are on the play for game three start things off with a spyglass siren play a captain storm next turn actually no i have a tapped red source and yeah, maybe it would have been worth volcano turn one yeah hold up this is not the right curve. I got a little too excited and started playing game, playing the game too quickly. But crewmate does help make up for my dumb curve. We should have played volcano turn one because then we get maximum storm value off of both the sirens getting the treasures. The one thing I did really wrong was not realizing that uh, I didn't have an untapped red source. So with an untapped red source, I think turn one spyglass siren would have still been reasonable. Because, like, sure, I miss out on one plus one plus one counter on Captain Storm, but that's worth it to curve out well. When my red source is tapped, not so much worth it. Okay, now I can Captain Storm and double blue spell here. Make up for this. All right, bad start to the game, but we're fixing things. 
Now we're finding some real solid curves. Against the green-red dinos decks that are going to have some nasty big cards, and even if we kill some dinos... Dang, Rumbling Rock Slide is enough damage that I can't save Captain Storm with a plus one plus one counter. But I can get another plus one plus one counter elsewhere while I still can. Probably just put it on the Siren here. Crewmate's already big enough to trade into Dinatomaton on an attack. Cool. Geological Appraiser. That's probably better than Plundering Pirate here, right? I imagine so. Let's see what we find. <laughs> Another Plundering Pirate. Yeah, that's better. An Appraiser and a Pirate. Probably better than just a Pirate. Now they've got no reach, so let's, let's explore. And if we buff something, buff the Flyer. Okay, just hit a land. Do I explore again using this treasure? I don't think so. I like leaving an expendable artifact around if we hit an iceberg. Do trade into the Dinatomaton. So they can exile it from their grave and try to cast it from grave with Paleontologist later. Obviously hoping to find a rock slide to deal with that, but we did hit a rock slide off the Discover, so there's one on the bottom. But we do have another one. They've got a single 4-5 blocker. Can block any one of our creatures and kill it, but then we hit for 3, 4, 5, 6 damage. Pretty much have their life total. Get a random spell or a plundering pirate. I want to greed it up and just hope for luck. I'm going to greed it up. Okay. Inverted Iceberg is a good one. Uh, no Artifact in Grave, right? Yeah, no Artifact in Grave, so we want to keep one of these for the Iceberg, so we don't want to use the Treasure to explore this turn. Worth a Chump Attack. Sack a 3-2 to deal 6. Then they're at 7 life. I think so. Put them to six life this way if they just kill the flyer. There's a plundering pirate of their own. Get a red source from their treasure. They keep looking at our iceberg. Do they have main deck artifact removal for it? Is that what's going on? Burning Sun Cavalry. Now just another blocker to make sure they don't take anything on the crackback. Find a Sunshot Militia while they're at six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I can hit them for four if I just tap everybody. I mean, I take a lot on the crack back. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, because this gets plus one, plus one. But I don't die on the crack back, so I just make it so if they can't kill Sunshot Militia, they die. This card's actually going to be gross, this Sunshot Militia thing. This is two games in a row now where this has been nuts. It just hit the board and slammed us for a bunch when LSV slammed it on us. And it is doing the same thing for us here, just as a late game draw. Yeah, if it's around next turn, they're literally just dead. My lord. And I get to hold up the Cogwork Wrestler as a chump blocker to have an artifact in my grave for the inverted iceberg craft. If our Sunshot Militia does die. Nope, there's the concession from our opponent. We are 2-1, and one, heading into Game 3. Big MVP shout-out to Sunshot Militia there. Here we are for Game 4, 2-1 and one right now. 
excellent hand. Probably just go Captain Storm into the Plundering Pirate. Hope for no early removal from our opponent. There's a Waterlogged Hulk turn one, so get the self-mill going for their Descend cards. Fill that graveyard with a bunch of permanents if they can. And this can craft with an island, so they just exile a milled island later in the game to turn this into that vehicle. They're on a blue-white deck. They milled a Sanguine Evangelist, which is a great rare. Spits out a wide board state pretty quickly. Captain Storm has hit the board, and we're ready to raid some Cosmium. I don't know what that means, but I'm going to do it. Here's a Plundering Pirate to trigger Captain Storm. There's the Confounding Riddle to counter it. Let's jam in for two. There is one common removal spell that exiles a tapped creature for three, exiles an untapped for six, but I don't think I play around that here. I think I just get the damage in. Now we can play Crewmate and Iceberg. Have a 3-3 Captain Storm attack in. I'd have to make Captain Storm a 5-5 to make it worth attacking, though. So for old Caveworm, is going to be large, a 4-5. Yeah, we're going to need to get a big board here. Let's drop the crewmate, see what it draws. Draws another crewmate? Well, that seems pretty good. <laughs> they got the Goose Mother. I'm just going to get my first plus one plus one counter here, though. Start juicing up the crewmate. So if I play two artifacts next turn, then uh, I can actually attack into the cave worm. And once we have another pirate on board other than Captain Storm, uh, if they're both untapped, it's probably best to buff the non-Captain Storm pirate so they can't use one removal spell to deal with all of our biggest cards. Oh, the Millennium Calendar! Oh, and a braided net with it to slow us down a bunch. So the Millennium Calendar gets counters on it whenever they untap their permanents, equal to the number of untapped permanents, and then they can double those counters by tapping it. Once it gets a thousand time counters, we die. Generally, that takes about nine turns. So if this game lasts nine more turns, we're going to die. So we need to get as aggressive as we can. So let's rock slide the cave worm. Braided net's going to tap one of our creatures. Stops its activated abilities, but not its triggered abilities, so playing an artifact will still buff one of our creatures here. Dang, I need to get the fancy emotes like our opponent did here. Spread out the threats because they have the tapper effect, so now I don't want to have like one four power creature and one two power creature, or they'll just tap the four power creature. Stop more damage that way. Alright, poke for three. They're down to 15, and we need to outrace the Millennium Calendar, which already has seven counters which can be doubled up to 14 for two mana. Again, a thousand's a lot, but doubling it up every single time gives them exponential returns. Goes to 14, then 28, and then it just goes so big so fast, especially when they're also getting more from untapping their lands and stuff. So this game, it might be closer to seven or eight turns than eight or nine in terms of how fast it pops off. Probably still eight or nine. But hopefully we got enough good aggro nonsense to kill them fast enough here. And best play here is to just slam down a 6-6, six, six, right? I guess I don't have an artifact in Grave, so I'd have to sack my card draw to do it to get my 6-6 six, six off the iceberg. I could play multiple creatures instead. Yeah, I think I'll just play multiple creatures instead here. That's probably fine. And then the Militia can start shooting them with my Puzzle Door and Iceberg, which is cute. Find a Plundering Pirate, that's a beautiful one. That gives us a token to sack to the Iceberg to craft. So now I'm going to go Pirate and Puzzle Door instead of playing Militia this turn. Just get a super wide board state of three power creatures here. Ooh, 
Ooh, a lodestone needle. When it hits the board, tap an artifact or creature and put two stun counters on it. They're going for it. They're going full Millennium Calendar here. Absolute stall. They're going to take zero damage from our attacks this turn. That's big stuff. All right. Let's dig for something. Well, I guess I'll have the mana, actually. Yeah, even if I use the treasure here, I'll have the mana next turn to spend one to sacrifice the puzzle door and then six to exile it from my grave and craft that way. I'm finding new synergies I didn't even think of. Yeah, so for one mana we put this into our graveyard and you can craft an artifact that's in your graveyard. Yeah, this puzzle door is going to be awesome next turn. So we can just spend the treasure on the militia and get some damage in here. All right, the calendar is at 14 counters. Which is quite far. I don't think they've actually doubled it once. They've just keep kept uh, untapping cards. They've untapped 14 cards throughout this game so far. All right, craft the waterlogged hulk. Which, what happens when it's descended? It can't be blocked. Okay, that doesn't really matter. Oh... I'm not gonna... That's so rude. If they get the Millennium Calendar to a thousand, I'm just gonna let them win. I'm not abrading that. Oh my god. Such a rude draw. Guess they tap the pirate this turn. The plundering pirate. <laughs> I need to remember pretty much all our creatures are pirates here. Most of them. Not the militia or the iceberg titan. Yeah, I, I don't think they're making it anywhere near a thousand counters at this rate, it looks like. They just couldn't afford to be doubling the counters rather than playing defensive spells because of our very large board state. All right, they can craft the braided net now, draw a bunch of cards for all their artifacts and slap it back into their deck to redraw it. They hit the Enigma Jewel to add to their activated abilities. Very cool deck from our opponent. But Pirate Beatdown just gets there. And we are three and one now, heading into game number five. Here we are for game five against Nikolai Bolas now, a fellow YouTuber. Does a lot of draft content there, highly recommend him. We're going to start things off with a Spyglass Siren, regardless of the fact that we have Captain Storm in hand, because we don't have a red source in this hand, but I'm still keeping it with the Siren and the Iceberg to try to draw into the red source. Awkward to immediately hit the red source for the Captain Storm, but uh, yeah, sometimes it happens. It's still a good thing overall, it just makes the turn one siren look a little bit awkward. Cool, now I can Iceberg and Cogwork Wrestler out of nowhere. Iceberg, counter on the siren, jamming with the team, Wrestler if Nikolai goes for a block, which would win with or without Captain Storm's trigger, but really wins with Captain Storm's trigger. Probably buff the Siren again, honestly. Turn three, Tithing Blade. I gotta sack my one, two. Oof. Now we get a Geological Appraiser and see what we hit. If we get a Plundering Pirate, this game's like... unlosable. But Spyglass Siren is the, the, uh, the hit here, which is still solid. Nikolai's down to 10. This Sunshot Militia gets a lot of damage in with these map tokens, even if I don't want to crack them. There's a Sunshot Militia of his own. Okay. Five mana here. Probably crack a couple maps and see what's coming up. Find a Plundering Pirate. I will keep that. Play a plundering, plundering Pirate next turn. I already have an Artifact 
in my uh, in my graveyard for the inverted iceberg, so I don't need to keep these maps around. Buffing Captain Storm so I can attack into the militia on the ground with my whole board. Uh oh, combat trick, kill the Captain Storm. Captain Storm has done well more than enough work by now. All right. Put Nikolai to literally one and finish him off with a Sunshot Militia. It is. That is going to be four and one. Oh, I feel like uh, like the LSV of that match <laughs> when I got just totally crushed by LSV with the insane curve. That time we got the insane curve. That... I don't know how you beat that curve without, like, a board wipe or something. Those were absurd draws for us last game. All right, here we are on the play for game number five. We've got a turn two staunch crewmate, which is a great way to start things off. Ooh, a Cogwork Wrestler for a combat trick if we need it, and we'll have it up next turn off the treasure token. Ooh, and find a Captain Storm. Need another blue source to play Captain Storm and the Wrestler in the same turn, which is a bit unfortunate. Do not top deck the island. So I have to play off curve to play Captain Storm this turn. What on earth is this? Oh, it's this thing. This card's insane. 2-4 Death Touch. When it attacks the player with the most life, you get a 1-1 one, one Life Link. When it attacks while well, you have the most life, you draw a card, lose life. So no matter what, it has an excellent attack trigger. And a 2-4 Death Touch is just a really annoying body. So, it's probably... I actually think I... Lundering Pirate here and then Rumbling Rock Slide their 2-4 next turn. And then I actually get an attack in against the 2-3. Which is why we're playing off curve with the Captain Storm, which is awkward. Because it lets us get damage in next turn. Start that ball rolling. Unless they don't play the 2 4 Death Touch, but don't imagine that's a thing. All right, there's the 2-4 Death Touch. We're going to rock slide that immediately before it gets a single attack trigger, and we draw into an Abrade for more interaction, which is great. Boom. Our opponent is down to 15, and we are at 18. There's their fourth mana. Drop a Cartographer's Companion for a 2-1 and a map token. They are immediately going to explore onto the River Herald Scout. And it is a non-land card, so that River Herald Scout is a 3-4 now. They're going to mill their Cogwork Wrestler. How could you do that to the poor guy? Okay, now we can Captain Storm, Plundering Pirate, and have a Wrestler for an instant speed plus one plus one counter. Should be gross. We make both of these big enough that one plus one plus one counter tips the scales towards killing the River Herald Scout while not dying. Okay, so I can only keep one of these either way, so we keep the 4-3, right? Alright, we have to put the plus one plus one counter on this crewmate, and we want a minus two minus zero on the River Herald so that we keep the 4-3 as well, instead of keeping the 3-2. There's Didact Echo, 3-2 flyer that draws a card when it hits the board, but it also dies to a braid for me to get a bunch of damage in. Empty-handed, ready to discover a card next turn and just try to beat down for lethal in two swings. They are down to four, so it feels pretty likely we can do that. There's the GG from our opponent and the concession. We are now 5 and 1 in the money if we were not playing with Wizards of the Coast Monopoly bucks here. So really nice place to be for the first draft of the format. Sweet, sweet stuff from the Blue Red Pirates deck.
Here we are now for game number seven. This is a risky keep, but you know how much I love that Captain Storm. I might do it. We use the puzzle door to dig towards the red source. We're on the draw as well. Probably not a hand we should keep, but it is what I'm going to. Again, find a red source off puzzle door and we are go for liftoff. And now we just have the red source already. So... Maybe it's greedy to hold off on the puzzle door here, but I'm going to do it and get the storm out first. There's Deconstruction Hammers. So they can blow up one of our artifacts or enchantments. They can also buff up their Flying Lifelinker, and that is going to be hard to race. That is two lifelinking damage a turn, so we lose two life and they gain two life every turn. They are the green-white deck, which has a lot of cards that care about having creatures with higher power than their base power. So it cares about plus one, plus one counters, equipment, auras, all that kinds of stuff. I think the play is to get as aggressive as possible, get as quick of a curve as possible here, which involves playing the Plundering Pirate for mana rather than the, uh, the Waterwind Scout for a map. The issue here is I might want to use that mana for a rumbling rock slide on the ruin lurker bat so that we actually have a shot at a race here and i'm also scared they could have the plus one plus three untap a creature trick to kill captain storm and that would be pretty bad for me well this could be a bad idea but i'm actually just going to crack for spyglass siren rather than attacking into a potential combat trick to untap the bats because there is a common that untaps their creature, gives it plus one, plus three here. So let's just play our own 2-2 flyer to try to trade into that bat. Oh, all right. Well, there's the trick right there. They could just trade a flanker into Captain Storm and also scry two. That one's a rare, though, so you'll see it a lot less often. Still pretty glad I didn't attack. All right, send in the flanker is the play. They've got a six life advantage here right now. Probably is fine to throw a pirate underneath the, the flanker, a plundering pirate, that is. Do have a massive crack back. Yeah, I'll still be at 13. Let's just take this damage. Oh, the Watley's final strike to just... Clear our captain out of the way anyway. Hit for one more damage this turn. That is brutal. Okay. So now we're definitely all in on getting to these rock slides. So let's just get the treasure. So I know I can rock slide a thing next turn. Maybe plundering pirate trades in the bat. That'd be nice. It does not. River Herald Guide, a 3-1 that explores when it hits the board, so it is going to be a 4-2 Vigilance. And they'll keep the Iron Paw Aspirants on top of their deck here. Yeah, at this point, without Captain Storm, we are really not outracing them. I think we just take the trade. They can scry one, but they already kept the Aspirant, so... I imagine they're putting it back on top here. Cool. I have a 3-2 on the ground to trade into their 4-2. I can attack with my 2-2 flyer and play another 2-2 flyer to have one on blocks here. I think that's reasonable. I don't think I need to rock slide the flyer. Hit a Cogwork Wrestler. Eh, I think I can mill that. I don't think that's exceptional here. There's the Iron Paw Aspirants. Buff the bat. Well, I've got a 3-3 flyer to trade into it still. And we can uh, now rock slide it. That's probably big enough to blow up here. It's 
So the Aspirant threatens to be a 2-3 with the equipment alone, so I need to keep that in mind when holding up blockers. They're going to scry to the bottom, and we're going to hit an Abrade. Abrade's interesting. I think Abrade's actually better than Rock Slide in this matchup, so I should hold on to that and play the Rock Slide this turn. Because being instant speed and also being able to like blow up the hammer out of nowhere is pretty sick. At 9 life, I think I hold up my 3-3 blocker for their potential 2-3 attacker. Miner's Guidewing. When that dies, they get to explore again, and it's just another little flyer to slap the equipment onto, so a 2-2 Flying Vigilance here. Um, do I Rock Slide again, saving a Braid for later? Yet again? I mean, I don't love it. I could just attack in, and if they block, then I can abrade, and I can hold the 3-3 three, three up so they can't attack back into me. Uh-oh. They have a single green combat trick here? Or do we get the two for one? Do we kill the hammer and the guide wing? We do kill the hammer and the guide wing. Nice one there. Now the Aspirant Explorers, which makes it a 2-3. Oh my god, and their top deck's incredible. A 3-4 Vigilance that makes a map token when it hits the board and every time it attacks? That's gonna be nuts. Alright. Let's drop our Puzzle Door and our Militia, I think. Two three attacker. I think I just hold the blockers up. We know they don't have another land in their hand right now. Because they have not played a land for a million turns. So they can't like immediately explore and make the aspirant bigger here. Which means I guess we do get to just rock slide this sentinel thing. Which is definitely worth it. That thing is scary. Now we have to worry about this Aspirant turning into a 3-4, though. Which I will just not have any good blocks for at that point, no matter what. I guess if we can turn something into a 2-4, I will. Let's see if we can. Perfect. And that's not a bad draw, either. So now I have a 2-4 blocker for a 3-4 Aspirants. With this iceberg, we'll be crafting with our puzzle door that's in the graveyard. Or our wrestler. Totally forgot we milled that earlier. It has definitely seemed like Descend 8 is happening a lot more consistently than I thought it would during the set review. All the explore running around with the just like mill and draw a card or uh, look at the top two, put one in your hand and the other into the grave, all that little kind of stuff. It has been stacking to a lot of games with, like, nearly eight cards in Graveyard most of the time. When the the games aren't just, like, a super aggro pirate curve, like when I lost to LSV or when I beat Nokolai there. When there wasn't just an absurd hyper aggro curve going on, there have been some massive graveyards, which is very cool. Alright, another Miner's Guide wing has arrived. Let's drop the iceberg. See what it draws. Oh, it milled our rare. No, a call for call. Sadness on the stack. We did hit the sixth land, though, for the iceberg. Let's see what Puzzle Door does. Finds a Dino Tomaton, because I've already got the sixth mana anyway. Can't cast that this turn, though. Hit for five, take one from the guide wing on the crack back. I guess unless there's a non-land on top again, then they can put a counter on Aspirants, and Militia might have to chump here. How many lands are in their deck? What is going on? How have they still not explored into a land a single time? That is wild. Well, they are at 13. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 damage next turn. 8 from a ping. It's not going to be lethal. Don't want to have to chump with Militia. I'm at 9. I shouldn't have to. I don't think there's going to be a plus 5, plus 5 trick. Let's just get our 1 damage in since we can't favorably block anymore. 
Maybe there is plus five, plus five, though. And we're just dead. Does not look like it. There's a land. They finally found one. Hits the board tapped. And there's a removal spell for our 3-3 flyer. Cool, let's just drop a 6-6 six, six to block the 4-5 and hit them for 4. Hope they don't have another removal spell. I don't think there's really a reason to hold this extra island in our hand against a non-black deck. We don't have anything that's like discard a card, draw a card in this deck. We cut our Sahili's thingy. Th Uh-oh. They have the over the edge just blow up an artifact. We're at one life. Okay, at least they didn't have the combat trick to kill us. But we really need to hold up like two blockers every turn now for the rest of the game. Which significantly slows down our kill on our opponent. Helping hand bring back the sentinel. That is disgusting. Now I need three blockers up to not die to removal, but they are playing off the top. Hopefully they explore and we just get to see exactly what they're going to draw. That'll help us a lot here. To know exactly what to play around? No, they just hit a land. As do we. Um, This is super, super bad. So map tokens can only be used at sorcery speed, at least. So they can't, like, buff the sentinels. So my 4-3 can trade into it on blocks and we have to chump the aspirant to not die. Yeah, feels like our best bet is poke for two with the flyer. We need them to just miss this turn. I guess they can play a land and discover off this, which could be a creature, but hopefully not removal. We need them to miss removal. If they miss a removal spell, our game plan is to trade with the Sentinel Trump there, draw into something here. All right, they didn't discover, so no chance of discovering the removal spell. Oh no, what are they top deck? Oh, nothing. I just saw them looking at their hand there. The fears of playing Magic Arena and seeing your opponent's hand get highlighted. The heartbeat increases tenfold. Alright, well, they found all their lands in one chunk after finding all the non-lands in one chunk. That is such a good draw. Two spells off one card is really important here to be able to keep attacking. It's a Spyglass Siren as well, so we get to explore, dig a land out of the way, or see what we're going to draw into. And that's the perfect chump blocker, a 1-1 one, one chumper. Oh, Brackish Blunder? I will absolutely bounce the 4-5 so it comes back as a 2-3. Ooh, those were some big hits. Hitting a Discover card into an Explore card is such a good way to draw some cards here. Set up for the future. All right. Jamming with the 4-5, we get the chump block off. Oh, but they found the trample trick, which would have killed us no matter how we blocked. Oh, so close. We were one turn from the kill there, but just one card off really in the end. Five and two, heading into round eight. Here we are now for round eight. Not the best hand ever, not starting till turn three, but I am... A big enjoyer of some plundering pirates. Goblin Tomb Raider turn one from our opponent, and we've hit a bonus land and unnecessary mana for us. There's a dowsing device, so as they're getting treasure tokens, they're getting extra damage in. Ooh, well this makes the plundering pirates way better. Every time we get a treasure, we also get to draw a card off of a call pa call. Could have braid the a call pa call here post combat. I don't think I can just sit here and take a bunch of damage, though. Alright, chart a course to draw two. Let's plunder a pirate. Poke for one. And yeah, they could play some hasters, though I'd, I would want that up for. That's a difficult choice. I'm going to take the crewmate here. 
I could go pirate plus crewmate if they don't play something I want to rock slide. 3-2 body is not really something I want to rock slide. The big issue is that it makes two cards. Uh-oh. They cast any artifacts, they're going to start getting dinos for free. Spooky. The poetic ingenuity here. All right. It is an insane value war over here. Both of us are going to draw so many cards. Um, I kind of want to drop the iceberg so I know I can just drop a 6-6 six, six next turn. Since I drew into that. Yeah, a 6-6 six, six blocker is a massive deal. Sure, I can poke with one pirate. Get a trade. I guess I could spend the treasure tokens. Do I have an artifact engrave? I don't have an artifact engrave, so I don't think I want to spend both treasure tokens here. Although I could mill an artifact off of a call if I'm lucky. No, nah, I don't think I'm going to do that. There's our own geological appraiser. S tier uncommon has arrived. Gold Fury Strider that can keep buffing a creature by tapping an untapped creature and an artifact. And it spits out a dino because that's an artifact spell. They can attack him with a 5-2 Geological Appraiser this turn if they want. Oh, and the Dowsing Device does give haste, so if you cast any artifact creatures, you give the artifact creature haste. That's cute. Okay. Well, now I am interesting in, interested in Rumbling Rock Slide. Because that Gold Fury Strider is pretty spooky. So let's just get that out of here. Drop a Spyglass Siren to trigger a call -a call And I suppose I will have a treasure left over, even if I play Crewmate, or I'll have two maps left over if I play a Scout. Let's play a Crewmate. Find a Plundering Pirate. Trade into a 3-1 here is a little bit sad, but we have so much card advantage going on here, I think we can compete with Poetic Ingenuity in terms of just trading into it over and over. Find another Iceberg. It's going to be another game where I really need to just not mill out, I think, in the end. There's an Oaken Siren to go with the Poetic Ingenuity. So our opponent is just full on the Artifact Spell deck with the Ingenuity. They have really got there. The Waylaying Pirates, which stuns something when it hits the board. It's going to stun a call per call. Alright, that's fine. Crewmate for Appraiser, take two. Drop the 6-6 six, six and pass, right? I think I get rid of the map here over the treasure, because we're never going to run out of cards, but we don't have enough mana to play everything all the time. Yeah, like I might even just play another Iceberg right now. Probably should. I guess the only card I could hit that would make me not want to do this is if I draw into a Braid off of a Call per Call. Captain Storm's a bit late, but still a better card than the Puzzle Door. We only have 14 cards left now. Okay, so they only have one flyer, so our game plan here is probably to just jam out six sixes on the ground and just put a bunch of plus one plus one counters on our two flyers. Right, put plus one plus one counters on the pirate because it's a pirate, thanks to Captain Storm, and put plus one plus ones on the Waterwind Scout with map tokens. That feels like the plan. So we have a 6-6 six, six to trade another 6-5. So we drop the captain. Play some artifacts, put encounters on Spyglass Siren.
jamming with the flyers every turn. Eleven cards left. Hoverstone Pilgrim. So they can make sure they never mill out with that thing. And it's also a gigantic flyer. But I have the rock slide. I just have to spend the ward mana, which will be a little annoying. All right. Rock slide with the ward mana on the gigantic flyer. Let's appraise some stuff. Cogwork Wrestler. Doesn't really matter what I target. Mainly getting a counter on this, the Flying Pirate here. Alright. Seven cards left. Four cards left if I play Plundering Pirate. I do have the mana to do Plundering Pirate and the Iceberg. And that only triggers a call but call once, but it triggers Captain Storm twice, so I think we do it. They die in two turns to the flyers, and we can just attack all the turn after this. Kill them with non-flyers, too. I'll have four cards left. I should be fine. And there's the concession from our opponent. We are six and two, which means we get to play nine games of Magic, the maximum you can play in a Premier Draft. For our draft today of this early access event, which is going to be awesome. So no matter what happens, got the full value in terms of gameplay length of this draft. And the format has been very cool so far. These blue-red artifact decks definitely popping off. But we'll see how it all ends up as we head into the final battle, win or lose. And here we are for our final boss, and it's a major one. We are against Reed Duke, pro player and Hall of Famer. I think LSV is a Hall of Famer as well, I'm pretty sure. Um, so definitely some pro players in this early access event, and we are going to be fighting our hearts out for this last battle with a call a call in the opener alongside some great ways to trigger it. I think I still curve out with the Spyglass Spiron, or Siren here, not Spiron. Because uh, it's going to be several turns before we get a call a call down, and we can still a call a call into the plundering pirate. So Reed has started with a hidden cataract, which can discover later in the game. One time, he'll have to sacrifice it to do that. All right, Oaken Siren is the first play from Reed, and I could kill that and slow down his artifact mana ramp and hit with Siren, or I can hope to have a uh, non-land on top to get the plus and plus one counter on Siren and attack in that way. I think it's reasonable enough to kill the mana ramp when we've just seen a fellow blue-red deck that had a bunch of big artifact spells to play later. So let's just blow that up and get in here. There's an inverted iceberg. Mill a card, draw a card. And Reed already has the artifact engraved to craft this as a 6-6 six, six later in the game. And there's another tapped land, the red discover land. So here comes Call Pakal here. Jam in for one. Depends on what we draw here, but there is going to be a question between playing the Appraiser and the Pluttering Pirate. The Appraiser is definitely the more impactful play, but it doesn't guarantee that we get an artifact hitting the board to trigger a Call Pakal. So both of these kind of draw us a card when we play them when we have a Call Pakal on board. 
because this casts another spell for free and this triggers a call call guaranteed. There's the Belligerent, which is a huge card dragon if you can get an attack off with it, but you have to crew it for three first. So Reed can probably do that next turn, just play any creature, crew the Belligerent, send in. I'm going to get a little greedy here. I'm going to go for the Appraiser. We have enough treasure token and map token producing cards that it is very possible. We can flip one off of Discover and both cast two spells this turn and draw off a Call Pa Call. Crewmate is not one of them. So we won't draw off a Call Pa Call, but we'll draw off of Crewmate most likely. Yep, hit a Cogwork Wrestler. Jam in for two. And the Wrestler kind of makes up for lost time with a Call Pa Call if it's still around next turn, because then we drop a Plundering Pirate and draw a card during our turn drop a Cogwork Wrestler during their turn, and draw another card. Since this triggers during each end step. There's a Zoetic Glyph, putting it on the Inverted Iceberg rather than the Belligerent here to just crew the Belligerent. Send in. So Reed can play stuff from the top here, but still has to pay the mana value. So Reed's close to tapped out. I think I try to just outrace here rather than trading to Belligerent if he's not going to get to draw any cards off it this turn anyway. So I'm going to go no blocks, keep these to attack with. All right, he does draw land off the top. And that is all. So here's Plundering Pirate. I guess it doesn't get any pre-combat triggers. Anyway, so we don't have to do it pre-combat. Could use the map token pre-combat, still have the pirate and wrestler mana, so let's do that. See if we can buff the flyer, I guess. Find another mana. Oh, I should have used that before I played a land. That was kind of loose. Reed is down to 9. Here's another 3-2 to attack with. And of course we'll have a Cogwork Wrestler as well. Drawn to a Puzzle Door or a Tapped Hidden Volcano. I'd rather have the Untapped Puzzle Door. Just drawn to something immediately. Oh no, that is one of the cards I gave an S tier in the set review, one of the hardest to beat rares in the format. Trumpeting Carnosaur, 6 mana, 7, 6 that discovers 5. Absolutely busted rare. It's a 7, 6 that casts your next spell out of your deck for free, basically regardless of its mana cost, and... If your opponent's really aggressive and you can't afford to get there, it's also a removal spell in your hand. Three mana at instant speed for three to a creature. Planeswalker, incredible card. For Reed, it is going to get the Carnosaur and the Nautilus, and Reed's going to get to crew the Belligerent, send that in if he wants. But he does have to be a little concerned about our crackback at nine life here. But this board state is quickly getting out of hand for us. This stuff is so large. Even if we had traded into the Belligerent, we're still still dealing with a 5-4 and a 7-6. So, Reed might start just crushing us with just the pure size of his threats here. I think it's better to trigger a Call Pacall twice here and just play the Cogwork Wrestler to get the trigger. Oh, I needed to do it in the main phase. Oh, it's annoying. I clicked too much. Uh, I can't believe I had to do that before the beginning of the end step. Yeah, I had to do that when he moved to end. That's an annoying punt. We should have gotten the draw trigger there. There was no reason not to. It was just... When I clicked the buttons to move to the next step. Let's dig off the puzzle door. See if we find a rumbling rock slide, maybe. Clear out the Carnosaur on attacks. We've got a couple copies of that. Also pick up the bounce spell to return something to hand. We'd obviously want to use that on the iceberg here. Alright, well we find a crewmate to dig for more pirates to just flood a super wide board state out here. Another plundering pirate. We'll just play that for turn. To trigger a call pa call. 
Man, I'm still really sad that I missed that extra card draw. Got to get better at clicking the spells at the right step. No reach over there, I believe. Yeah, ping for one. Drawn to another flyer seems decent. Menace Dino is also not bad. And these are both good draws. I'm going to take this Siren, though. I like the digging from the map token. Basically our win condition here, just play so many creatures that we can just attack with everybody and find 8 damage. Regardless of Reed's massive creatures on board. Reed's game plan is probably to just randomly kill me with an attack. There's 15 damage off of 2 creatures hitting me at this point. I have really rough blocks. Because Reed's going to have a million open mana for removal spells and tricks. It's going to be very, very hard to block favorably, but our biggest thing going for us is that Reed can't attack too hard without leaving himself relatively vulnerable on our counterattack. Alright, so here's the Belligerent, which is going to get a million pieces of card draw no matter what. Off the top. And then I could block with, like, absolutely everybody to make sure I kill this through instant speed removal spells like a braid. But then again, I don't have my wide counterattack for 8 attempt here. I think I just take it, honestly. And keep this board state as wide as possible. Ooh, a Neem Pakal. Another S tier rare in the set review. When they attack with any non gnome creature, they get a plus one plus one counter on this and then create X 1 1 gnomes that are also tapped and attacking, where X and them are plus one plus one counters on this. So a snowballing effect that just comes becomes quickly unbeatable. Yeah, Reed has way too many insanely powerful rares here. And yeah, that was like a draw four this turn. Game's looking pretty over. Well, there's Rumbling Rock Slide now to kill one creature. Reed is basically tapped out, so if I kill the Carnosaur, that's four blockers. Reed blocks one, two, three, four creatures, takes one, two, three, four, five damage. Reed does not get close to dying. At 10 life, I really have to be worried about the Sunshot Militia and the 7-6 Trampler and just a lot of stuff in general. I mean, I can Rock Slide and play a Pirate and a Siren. And crack a map, I guess. I think it is Kill the Carnosaur. I mean, a call book call is going to trigger, so I think we keep that. If I attack with everybody, once again, four blockers. Uh, block, block, block all the three power creatures and one two power creature. Take one, two, three, four, five, six, which is just not lethal. And then Reed kills me on the crackback because I don't have enough stuff untapped and he's got a sunshot militia. So I think I have to just chip with the flyer and hope we do something insane with Captain Storm next turn to kill with flyers. It's gotta be wildly close. 
we do lose this game in the end. I think the biggest play that could have went differently is maybe if Reed did not have uh, instant speed bouncer removal in hand with the belligerent early, we could have gotten the double block and killed it. But I imagine at that time, if we did that, he still had Carnosaur in hand, so he could have at worst killed one of our creatures with Carnosaur, kept a belligerent, won that combat, killing both our creatures. So I don't know if that would have ended up much better for us, but then he wouldn't be playing Carnosaur later at least. It's a really interesting game in terms of the lines we could have done differently. I think that's the big one that might lead to different outcomes. That early turn when he attacked in with Belligerent, we had a 3-2 and a 2-1 up. Again, we know for a f We're fairly certain he had Carnosaur in hand at the time, at least. But he might not want to... He might not have wanted to use that to win that combat. And if he had an Abraid or a Bounce Spell or anything like that instead, then that block would have been really, really bad. So, I don't know. Here's a Volatile Wanderglyph that lets Reed discard a card, draw a card every time it becomes tapped, and it can become tapped to the Sunshot Militia or to Crewing a Belligerent. Reed is at 6 life, facing 3 Power Flyers over here. If I top deck... There's some top decks I think I could hit that would kill Reed. Not a ton of them. But maybe like another uh, map producer, like the 2-2 two -two flyer that makes a map or something. Because we can hit Reed for a little bit on the ground. I only have to hit for 3 on the ground if I'm hitting for 3 in the sky to kill Reed. But he's got three mana up for removal, like an abrade or something at instant speed. Okay, if we let this in, we take ten and die, so we have to at least chump. So we block with the one, two. Actually, I think we actually block with a call -a call here to force Reed to use mana into buffing the Nautilus to kill a call -a call Because the game's not going to last long enough for us to use a call -a call another turn. If Reed lives another turn, we're dead. To Sunshot Militia. Just tapping everybody. So we do like that and like that. Get Reed to dump two mana into the Nautilus if he wants to kill a call -a call But if I go to five, am I still just dead to Sunshot Militia? So I'm at five life. Sunshot taps two things to deal one. We take one, two, three. If Reed can play four more permanents, we're dead. Oh wait, no, Reed does kill us, because this equipment is untapped, which also works, so I need to chump block with one more card. I think I have to chump block, so we put a 2-1 there. Maybe it's better to put 1-1 one, one flyer there. So I will be counterattacking with like everybody, but he's going to have five creatures untapped. If he doesn't go for the kill here, we're going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5... Six, seven, eight attackers on the ground. Maybe it is better to do one one flyer here. Oh boy. Let's see. Okay, he's gonna buff the Nautilus against the call call. Rather than Play four mana worth of cards. Shoot us with that for free. Hit a rumbling rock slide. So Captain Storm doesn't change our damage at all here. We kill Reed's captain and Reed has four blockers up on the ground. Wait, no, if I kill the captain, Reed crews the belligerent with it. So I actually kill something that has less than 3 power, so he can't just crew another blocker. So 5 blockers, if I kill a Militia, or a Wanderglyph, or an Anim Pakal, or a Nautilus, then Reed has 4 blockers total. Block, 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 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, that's our bet. 
We kill something that's not big enough to crew belligerent by itself. And then attack with everybody. Reed has one red mana up and he's dead on board. Okay, so he's going to crew with Wanderglyph and Nautilus, which still leaves him with four blockers instead of five by playing this. But it does let him draw a card to try to find a one red mana solution. Block all the three power creatures, take seven. Let's see the one mana spell. No one mana spell, that is seven and two. Some fierce competition during this early access, getting bodied by LSV and then turning the tables on Reed Duke in a super close game of magic to wrap it up. Incredible way to start this format off. Seeing a lot of blue red, which I don't know if it's indicative of the format's future or just one of those arena matchmaking uh, conspiracy theory things where, well, we're playing a blue-red draft deck, so we're just going to play against a bunch of blue-red. But, uh, I mean, I like the archetype. It's a fun, really cool archetype, and we've seen from our opponents there's several different builds of it. The Mana Leak had a build that was all about casting bigger artifact spells alongside the Dinosaur Producer that was pretty cool. LSV had an incredibly aggressively curved version of the build with the 1-2s to get plus 1, plus 0 oh, in haste and a million treasure tokens, and then Reed had a really explosive, really balmy version of the build that's trying to get to the gigantic Cardasaur and getting attacks in with the belligerent and stuff, so really interesting to see that even though we played the blue-red archetype and played against the same archetype three or four times this draft, they were all pretty different versions of this deck, which is very cool to see and a very good sign for the format as it progresses. Overall, had a really fun time with the format. I'm really looking forward to getting into more drafts, so I'm just going to end the video right now so I can immediately hop in and start recording tomorrow's draft. So that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching the video. If you enjoyed this video and you are interested in seeing some more Lost Caverns of Ixalan, just stay tuned on the channel. You can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more of these videos in your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.